Precision airstrikes have become the big stick of international relations. When diplomacy fails and military action is chosen, the missile-armed strike aircraft is at the center of combat. Many nations deploy advanced jet aircraft and high-tech missiles, but only one has the broad range of technologies and forces to deploy such weapons on a global scale, the United States. The ability to launch a global strike at targets around the world depends not only on the aircraft and precision guided weapons, but on a sophisticated network of space-based electronic sensors, advanced digital communication networks, and mobile logistics. An international crisis has occurred. The United States has decided to use military force to deal with the problem. The global strike force is assembled for action. We'll examine how such a strike unfolds. We will take a detailed look at the individual weapons of such a strike force. To launch a precision strike, Detailed, timely, and accurate information is the key. Days or months before an attack, spy sensors stare down on the objectives from the cold blackness of space. Satellites pass overhead, unheard and unseen, taking electronic images of potential targets and snatching telephone and radio transmissions with their electronic ears. In recent years, the spy satellites have been joined by a new breed of aerial snoop, the UAV, the Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. The target information processed thousands of miles away in the Pentagon's hidden layers, the instructions are sent out to plan the attack. Missile guidance systems are programmed, and strike fighter computers are fed their electronic target data. A global strike is a complex operation, requiring carefully timed, coordinated attacks from many different directions, using a variety of systems. The first mission in a global strike is to blind the enemy to prevent him from identifying the attack. Radars are at the heart of modern surveillance systems, so it is essential to blind these as soon as possible. Well, if the enemy can't see uh, the aircraft coming in, they can't shoot at them, they can't shoot them down. Uh, so if you get the radars, you blind the opponent. Uh, the only thing you have to worry about then are guns and short-range missiles uh, on the ground. Uh, but if you're coming in in a jet aircraft uh, and low, uh, you're usually you know, right past them before they can get a shot at you. Night is always the best time to attack since American strike systems are designed to operate 24 hours a day in all weather. The first step in blinding the enemy is to destroy any radars along the frontier. 
The reason that you want to attack the radars is that the radars, first of all, alert the enemy to the incoming aircraft, and second of all, they direct many of his weapons that would be used against the aircraft, for example, surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft guns. An ideal tool for such a mission is the Apache attack helicopter. The Apache is a nocturnal predator designed to operate in the shelter of darkness using its thermal night vision. Flying to the target at low altitude to avoid radar detection, it attacks its target using laser-guided Hellfire missiles. With the first layer of the enemy defensive shield removed, it is now necessary to blind radars deeper into enemy territory. Stealth attack aircraft are the spearhead of the strike. Aircraft such as the F-117 Strike Fighter and the B-2 Stealth Bomber use advanced aerospace design features to cloak themselves from the prying eyes of enemy radars. They are not invisible to human eyes, but they are virtually invisible to electronic sensors. They attack using the cover of night, As often as possible, air forces will do a process called targeting. They look for the most central factor. This could be an air defense command post. Uh, this could be things like a power plant that powers multiple radars. So they look for where things where a single bomb or a single airplane can make a difference. The F-117 Nighthawk is designed for precision night attack. Instead of attacking each enemy radar site individually, it attacks the brain centers connecting the radar network. By destroying the centers that collect and process the radar data, the enemy can be electronically blinded even if some radar sites remain. Paveway laser-guided bombs are the precision tools for this mission. The Nighthawk aims a precise laser beam at the target and the laser-guided bomb sees the reflection. The seeker, mounted on the nose, guides the bomb to within inches of the laser signal. Laser-guided bombs are the weapon of choice when you have a small target that has to be attacked with great precision. For example, if you have a bridge, you definitely want to use a laser-guided bomb because it can be directed to within a few feet of the target. You want to think of guided bombs, not just laser-guided. And the reason that guided bombs matter is the number of weapons we have is limited. 
So if you want to hit things, you better hit them precisely. Well, lasers and now a satellite guidance with the, the global positioning system, GPS, allows very accurate placement of weapons. So instead of laying down a thousand bombs, let's say, to hit a bridge, you hit the bridge. Instead of laying down enough bombs to destroy many city blocks, you hit the one building you care about. Not even several feet of earth and concrete can protect against laser-guided bombs. By encasing the warhead in a tube of high-strength steel, the bunker-busting GBU-28 laser-guided bomb can burrow through dozens of feet of earth, through steel-reinforced concrete, and still destroy a buried, hardened target. Concrete is no shield against such weapons. The ghostly shape of the B-2 stealth bomber gives only a hint of its high-tech attack capabilities. Unlike the relatively short-ranged F-117, the B-2 Spirit can fly from bases halfway around the world to attack targets with precision accuracy. The essence of a global strike is the ability to carry out attacks at very long distances. Yet no matter how large the aircraft, fuel capacity is always the critical limit to long-range flight. To solve this problem, air forces use aerial refueling aircraft. The United States was the pioneer of this practice and has become its most experienced practitioner. Not only does the use of aerial refueling aircraft permit long-range missions, it also increases the amount of bombs and missiles that a strike aircraft can carry. The American Armed Forces wages war on a global scale, but the problem with fighting wars at very long ranges, as far as aircraft are concerned, is that you have a choice. You can either put a lot of fuel in your aircraft or you can put a lot of bombs. Now, obviously, you want to carry as many bombs as possible. Now, what aero refueling enables you to do is carry as many bombs as you want and then to carry the fuel on the refuelers and refuel in mid-air. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the very long range that you need from a lot of fuel. And on the other hand, the bombers are enabled to carry a great deal of bombs and other weapons. Since there is a limit to the amount of payload or fuel a strike aircraft can carry during takeoff, they will load up on bombs and munitions, but with only partially full fuel tanks. Once airborne and at cruising altitude, they can top off their fuel tanks, carrying both maximum fuel and maximum war loads. While aerial refueling may not seem the most dramatic element of global strike, it is one of its most vital ingredients. When you start to think about the B-2 operations, you have to keep in mind that they oftentimes fly almost halfway around the globe. Now, when they send a B-2 off on its mission, they have to decide, is it going to carry bombs or is it going to carry fuel? Obviously, they want it to carry bombs or missiles or other types of munitions. So the selection there is to take off with as many bombs as you can, and then once you get up in the air, you can refuel the aircraft, fill up its fuel tanks. The B-2's unusual shape is designed to minimize its visibility to enemy radar. Even if enemy radar signals reach it, it is coated with special radar-absorbing materials to prevent the radar signal from returning back to the enemy radar base. So it remains invisible to electronic sensors. The B-2 is designed to attack from high altitude, high above the enemy's air defenses. This also protects it from other types of electronic sensors, such as imaging infrared sensors. The B-2's weapon of choice is the JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition. JDAM is the cutting edge in strike warfare. It is a revolution in aerial ordnance. It employs two forms of guidance to obtain its accuracy, GPS guidance and inertial guidance. GPS stands for Global Positioning Satellites. It is a constellation of satellites in constant orbit around the globe, emitting coded radio beams. The GPS receiver picks up the beams from several satellites and so is able to determine its precise location on the globe at any given moment. 
This system is familiar to civilians as well, since it is used today for navigation by hikers, as well as cars, boats and airplanes. The military version of the system relies on an additional coded signal for a higher level of accuracy than the civilian channels. Should an enemy try to jam the GPS signal, the JDAM uses a simple inertial navigation system that corrects for any wind drift to help steer the bomb to its target. What has made JDAM so revolutionary is not simply its sophistication, but also its low cost. The technology has come from mass market civilian electronics, giving the JDAM a price tag 20 times lower than other guided weapons. JDAM is so cheap that it is signaling the end of dumb bombs. For decades, military theorists have been predicting the arrival of the smart bomb. That day is now. In the 1991 Gulf War, only one munition in ten was a guided smart weapon. Today, nearly all air-delivered munitions are smart. There is a whole range of new guided weapons and the whole point of this is the use of the microchip revolution and ordnance. Now computer technology has become so cheap you can put it in a disposable container like a bomb. So this is why you can have systems like sensor fuse weapon like the JDAB. It is the microchip revolution come to war fighting. The B-2 stealth bomber attacks command centers and other vital targets. Among its missions may also be enemy missile sites and air bases. Some of these targets consist of widely scattered but weakly protected weapons such as exposed anti-aircraft missile batteries. Instead of attacking each single piece of equipment with a smart bomb, the B-2 can use wide area attack weapons such as cluster bombs. In the old days, cluster bombs were dumb and simply fell on their target without any guidance. Due to their broad coverage, guidance wasn't necessary. But today, even dumb bombs have become a little smarter. They are fitted with a wind-corrected munitions delivery kit. This electronic package contains a set of inertial reference sensors derived from those used in automobile airbag safety systems. Properly arranged, they can sense if the bomb is going off target due to wind drift. And if they begin to drift, the kit can send signals to the tail fins to steer them back on target. The B-2 and the F-117 stealth aircraft are expensive and scarce. They are used only for the most vital targets. But for a global strike to succeed, many targets must be attacked. This is the job of the cruise missile. Hundreds of cruise missiles can be used to attack targets that are too dangerous for aircraft that are not protected by stealth technology. During the first wave of the attack, the cruise missiles amplify the ferocity of the assault without exposing human pilots to danger. The workhorse of the cruise missiles is the Navy's Tomahawk. Since 1991, the Tomahawk has been upgraded with a GPS guidance system like that used in the JDAM guided bomb. Tomahawks come in many varieties. Some are armed with a single high explosive warhead for attacking bunkers or other important targets. Other versions of the Tomahawk carry cluster munitions for attacking large area targets such as airfields or tank parks. The Tomahawk is a versatile weapon that can be launched from many different platforms. Attack submarines can sneak undetected close to enemy shores launching tomahawks from special vertical launchers on the bow of the submarine, even from torpedo tubes. Further offshore, warships can carry and launch tomahawks by the dozen. 
The Burke-class destroyers and the Aegis cruisers carry the Tomahawks in special vertical launch cells deep in the bowels of the ship. The cruise missile has revolutionized modern warships. In decades past, warships and attack submarines could only attack naval targets or objectives very close to shore. With cruise missiles, they are now part of the global strike and can attack targets hundreds of miles inland. The Tomahawk is a very important system. It can either be used independently, as in some of the attacks in 1998 on Afghanistan, uh, or it can be used in conjunction with aircraft. Now remember, the Navy doesn't have stealth aircraft. So when the Navy is operating alone, they'll use the Tomahawks to take out missiles, air defense systems, and then right behind them come the FA-18s. You can also use them in conjunction with the Air Force's stealth fighters. You can use them in areas where air defenses are not yet suppressed or to avoid, especially in smaller situations, having a pilot shot down. <laughs> Missiles can also be launched off aircraft such as the B-52 bomber. Some of these are strategic cruise missiles that were originally designed for use in thermonuclear war. Their nuclear warheads have been removed and replaced by conventional high explosives. They are called CALCOM for conventional air-launched cruise missiles. The best way to avoid getting a B-52 within range of enemy missiles or radars is to equip them with a weapon that allows them to, you know, basically drop their load uh, way far away uh, from any, you know, possible danger. Uh, this was the reason why, you know, you came up with those air-launched you know, cruise missiles in the first place. The advantage of cruise missiles is that they allow bombers to attack targets from hundreds of miles away. So the bombers are never exposed to enemy anti-aircraft defenses, but can stand off and attack from outside harm's way. The Calcum is expensive, and it is so large that it can only be carried on large strike aircraft such as the B-52 bomber. As a result, since the 1991 Gulf War, the U.S. Armed Forces have begun developing a variety of smaller cruise missiles that can be carried by smaller strike aircraft.
The first of these is the JSAW, Joint Standoff Weapon. This is essentially a flying dump truck carrying a heavy payload of submunitions. Like other new standoff weapons, it relies on GPS for guidance. The basic version of JSAW carries a payload of submunitions to attack wide area targets. It can also carry smart payloads, such as the BAT Smart Munition, which is designed to attack pinpoint targets, such as tanks. The Air Force is also developing the JASM, or Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile. This resembles the JSAW in size and appearance, but uses a more sophisticated terminal guidance system to allow it to attack hardened targets with a single high-explosive warhead. The JASM, it takes the GPS INS guidance, which was developed for the JDAM bomb, and puts an engine on it, puts wings on it, makes it go further. It, so it's then a standoff weapon. It's intended to be cheap, use the same guidance that's proven so successful in Afghanistan, I don't believe any JASMs will be ready for the war against Iraq, maybe a few prototypes. The first stage of a global strike is the deep attack with cruise missiles and stealth aircraft that suppresses the enemy's air defenses and decapitates the enemy's command structure by shattering the headquarters and communications networks. The next phase of the strike is the close combat phase with the Air Force and Navy strike aircraft attacking enemy military forces. This is the job of the strike fighters. The U.S. Navy's workhorse strike fighter is the F.A. 18 Hornet. Since the 1991 Gulf War, the Navy has introduced the new E and F models called the Super Hornet. The Super Hornet is larger and heavier than the basic Hornet, designed to carry more payload to longer ranges. The Super Hornet is a robust, versatile aircraft designed to operate in the harsh naval environment. Blasting off from carrier catapults places a great strain on an aircraft, and the Super Hornet has been designed to take repeated punishment, even in peacetime training. What aircraft carriers do is they bring a lot of aircraft to within striking range of some target, and they bring them on U.S. territory. Navies are mobile U.S. territory. That's the key thing about navies. And they can stay there. There is substantial fuel, ordnance, other supplies on board. They can also take it from other ships. In fact, you can imagine a kind of conveyor belt in which it's aircraft carriers plus ammunition ships delivering things to wherever it is we're attacking. It's a very powerful combination. Naval air power is an essential ingredient in a global strike. The ability of the aircraft carrier to move around the world enables American defense planners to project power globally.
Land-based aircraft require nearby friendly bases. Sometimes these are not available for diplomatic reasons. Aircraft carriers can operate close to hostile shores in regions where the United States has few reliable allies. Since the 1991 Gulf War, the Navy has been simplifying its air wings by using the Hornet as its standard combat aircraft. In the past, the F-14 Tomcat performed the defensive fighter mission, while the Hornet performed the offensive strike mission. Today, the Super Hornet performs both the fighter and strike mission. The workhorse of the U.S. Air Force Strike Force is the F-16 Falcon. The F-16 is a smaller and lighter aircraft than the Hornet, powered by a single jet engine as opposed to the Hornet's twin engines. The F-16's basic technology has not changed much since the 1991 Gulf War, but its combat power has been considerably enhanced by the addition of new weapons. The F-16 can carry the whole range of smart weapons, including the Paveway laser-guided bomb, the JDAM, the JSAL. Some remarkable new weapons have been added to this arsenal. One of the most amazing of these is the SFW, or sensor-fused weapon. The SFW is a cluster munition designed to attack hard targets such as tank formations. Each SFW contains 10 submunitions. After the SFW is released from the F-16, its outer shell splits open to reveal the submunition. Each of these descends towards the target and a small parachute helps orient and slow its fall. When it reaches the right altitude over the target, the parachute falls away and small jets in the submunition begin spinning it. On each submunition are four skeet smart munitions. The submunition spins in order to hurl the skeets over a wide area. This unusual deployment method allows the SFW to scatter 40 skeets over a large area called its footprint. Each Skeet Smart Munition has a miniature millimeter wave radar sensor that can detect the metallic reflection of a tank. Once it spots the tank, the Skeet is detonated. The high explosive in the Skeet is specially shaped so it explosively forms a metal plate into a dense high-speed metal slug that can penetrate the tank's armor. This incredibly complex process happens in a matter of seconds. What had been a formation of powerful main battle tanks is now a field of burning wrecks. For missions deeper behind enemy lines, the US Air Force depends on the Strike Eagle. This is a special two-seat version of the famous F-15 Eagle fighter. The weapons officer in the back seat is a specialist in the use of advanced guided weapons. Some guided weapons, such as the GBU-15 and the AGM-130, use electro-optical seekers to permit pinpoint attack. The weapons officer in the Strike Eagle can monitor the flight path of the missile, seeing exactly what the missile sees. If the missile starts to veer from course, the weapons officer can steer it to the precise impact point. One of the Strike Fighter's most determined opponents is the enemy fighter aircraft. To defend against enemy fighters, the U.S. Air Force employs the F-15 Eagle. The F-15 is much the same as it was in the 1991 Gulf War, but its combat power has been enhanced by the arrival of two potent new missiles, the AIM-9X 
and the AMRAAM. The AIM-9X is the latest version of the famous Sidewinder family of missiles. It is designed for close-range dogfights. The Sidewinder first saw combat nearly 50 years ago. The new AIM-9X has little in common with the early Sidewinders except in its name. AIM-9X is the latest U.S. attempt at a very highly maneuverable missile. In the past, you had to point your airplane at the target. What you do in AIM-9X is the pilot wears a helmet. He looks at the target, wherever it is, wherever you can see it. The airplane registers where he's pointed. The seeker in the missile slews around to that direction. You fire the missile. Even if the target is in a very awkward location, the missile is violently enough maneuverable to turn around and, and get it. Well, that makes an enormous difference in air-to-air -air combat. The big change in the AIM-9X is its maneuverability. It is so maneuverable that it can make a complete 90-degree turn only a short distance away from the F-15. This enables the Eagle to attack targets during maneuvering dogfights. The other innovation on the AIM-9X is its imaging infrared seeker. This seeker is so sophisticated that it cannot be bluffed by flares or other types of infrared countermeasures that might have defeated earlier sidewinders. And it is so precise that it can be programmed to attack a specific part of the enemy fighter, such as the cockpit or the engine. But the Eagle pilot really does not want to wait until the last minute to engage an enemy fighter. It is far better to attack an enemy fighter from beyond the visual range, before the enemy pilot can see the Eagle. The weapon of choice for the long-range mission is the new Amran missile. The Amram uses an active radar seeker, a miniature version of the radar that the Eagle pilot uses to detect enemy fighters. Once the Eagle radar detects an enemy fighter at ranges of over 30 miles, the data is fed into the Amram's flight control computer. The Amram is then launched and navigates itself to the target, turning on its radar in the final phase of the flight to find the enemy fighter. This ability explains why the Amram is called a fire and forget missile. The advent of these revolutionary new missiles is something of a mixed blessing. They turn inexpensive and simple fighters into effective rivals of larger and more sophisticated aircraft of the types flown by the United States. As a result, they have led to yet another round in the never-ending technology arms race of fighter designs. To counter these missiles, the U.S. Air Force is beginning to field the world's first true stealth fighter, the F-22 Raptor. Although the F-117 is sometimes called a stealth fighter, it is, as we saw earlier, an attack aircraft, not optimized for air-to-air -air combat. On the other hand, the F-22 is designed primarily for aerial combat. The F-22 has certainly been politically controversial, but the Air Force remains committed to it. The reason the Air Force is committed is it is an air-to-air -air fighter intended to keep air superiority. Now, we have not had a serious challenge to American air superiority for many decades, and the Air Force wants to keep it that way. The reason the Air Force has made this their priority is they realize that if enemy fighter planes can gain superiority, everything else falls apart very quickly. Fortunately, in the past, our lessons, we've done this to the enemy. We've taken air superiority over Germany in 1944, other, other adversaries since then. If you do not have air superiority, all our AWACS, all our tankers, all the vast number of air-to-ground aircraft that, that we rely on are all at risk. The Air Force is looking to the F-22 as an antidote to the new generation of air-to-air -air missiles. These new active radar missiles like AMRAM, R-77, and Mika are so lethal that the Air Force wants some form of shield for its fighter planes, and that shield is stealth. F-22 protects itself by using stealth to 
defend itself against active radar missiles. And even if the enemy fighter should find the F-22 at close range, the radar seeker on the missile will have a difficult time locking on to the F-22 because of its anti-radar features. In contrast, the Raptor is designed to take maximum advantage of both the AMRAAM and its stealth features. By using a new generation radar, the F-22 can detect enemy fighters at very long ranges without giving away its presence. So the Raptor pilot will electronically see the enemy fighter first. In aerial combat, the first aircraft to fire its missiles is usually the victor. The aerial battlefield is a complex environment in modern wars, with a confusing mixture of friendly aircraft, enemy aircraft, standoff missiles and smart weapons flying through the air. There is a considerable risk that one friendly fighter will mistake another friendly aircraft for the enemy. To coordinate the air battle, the US armed forces depend on airborne command and control aircraft such as the E-3 AWACS. The AWACS is fitted with a large radar dome that surveys the air for hundreds of miles. It is the airborne electronic eyes of the air commander, but it is far more than merely an electronic sensor. Inside the AWACS is a complex of electronic processing equipment and experienced Air Force officers who use the data to create an accurate picture of the air battle. Using this data, the AWACS officers serve as electronic coaches for the friendly aircraft. Friendly fighters can be steered against enemy fighters long before their own radars can see the enemy. Friendly strike aircraft can be warned about the presence of enemy fighters so they can take evasive action in time. So the AWACS is both the brains and the eyes of the air commander. What you're seeing in modern wars is that less visible part AWACS and other kinds of aircraft also that, that do intelligence gathering jobs. A lot of intelligence gathering that you don't really think of as combat now is more combat oriented because it tells people what matters, where to shoot. So there's a whole slew of electronic reconnaissance aircraft that are really sensing what targets are. AWACS is part of that net. The Air Force uses AWACS to directly control fighters. But there's a larger control function also that operates out of ground control centers. All of those things are integrated together. Those airplanes are often called combat support, and that makes you think that, well, they're not that important. It's like uh, fueling airplanes. What you find in places like Afghanistan and what you will probably find in Iraq is that those supporting aircraft are absolutely crucial. And that's a major change in the way air combat is working. As we saw earlier, the Army's Apache helicopter often plays a vital role in the initial air campaign by eliminating troublesome radar sites along the frontier. But the Apache's real role is to provide airborne fire support for attacking ground troops. The Apache's most vital mission is to eliminate enemy armored vehicles. Due to its speed and range, it acts like a modern cavalry force, ranging far and wide over the battlefield and extending the army's power deep behind enemy lines. Since the 1991 Gulf War, the new AH-64D longbow version has appeared in service. This version uses the new longbow radar to improve its targeting ability in all weather conditions. It also uses an improved version of the Hellfire missile, capable of being fired under the most difficult conditions and with a warhead powerful enough to destroy the most heavily armored tank. The Apache is not large enough to carry standoff cruise missiles. The heavy firepower role falls to the Army's field artillery. The 
Besides conventional tubed artillery, the Army depends on a variety of rocket and missile weapons. The Multiple Launch Rocket System, or MLRS, earned the nickname of Steel Rain in the last Gulf War for its imposing firepower. It can fire unguided artillery rockets or the much larger Attackums missile. Since the 1991 war, the Attackums has been improved to give it greater range. As impressive as these weapons may be, even more futuristic weapons are being tested. The Predator started off life as a reconnaissance drone and served as such over Bosnia. It sent back real-time video photographs over a data link. Now, we would find many times that they would see a potential target, but by the time it got the information back to the person looking at the video, they called up a headquarters, and the headquarters called up a fighter bomber. The target was gone. Therefore, they decided uh, just before 9-11 that they would check putting two small missiles, of Hellfire missiles similar to that used on helicopters, under the wing of a Predator. This way, if a Predator finds a target on its reconnaissance mission, the person seeing the video can authorize it to attack it thereby cutting down the reaction time that allowed many targets to escape in places like Bosnia and Kosovo. The next generation of UCAV, the Boeing A-45, bears as little resemblance to the Predator as a chariot does to a sports car. The Boeing UCAV is a small, pilotless stealth strike platform armed with a variety of precision-guided munitions. It can be sent on missions too dangerous even for stealth aircraft. This unusual aircraft may very well represent the future of global strike.
The conduct of global military operations requires the coordinated efforts of thousands of high-tech warriors, backed up by a massive network of support services. When international crises call for military action, U.S. high-tech aircraft are able to destroy a fortified target with a single state-of-the-art missile. Her warships are able to launch a barrage of GPS-guided weapons to targets hundreds of miles away. And digitally equipped infantry can land safely with the support of sophisticated artillery and helicopters. Anywhere. At any time, the United States Armed Forces are prepared for a global strike.